Hello and welcome to Cup of Cosmology, the place for all your questions about the universe. My name is Diana Hooper and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently at the Helsinki Institute of Physics in the University of Helsinki over in Finland. And I'm Musk. I specialize in cosmology. So that means that I study the universe, the contents of the universe, how everything evolves, how everything interacts, all of the cool stuff happening inside the universe. Now, of course, I don't study everything in the universe. I do have to specialize. But in general, my focus within theoretical physics is the cool stuff happening inside the universe. And I love being a scientist. It's really, really fun. Most of the time, it has its ups and downs. So most of the time, it's really fun. And I love chatting to everyone about all of the cool things happening inside the universe universe. So wherever you're watching me on, if you're on Twitter, hello. If you're on YouTube, hello. Hello to all of the regulars, Scott, the, the two Davids, Paul, great to see all of the regulars coming in in the comments here. I'm not all, but great to see the regulars coming in. Ben, great to see you as well. Wherever you're watching from, welcome. If you're a new viewer, first time here, welcome as well. Everyone here is welcome. So the, the idea behind Cup of Cosmology is that I get to ramble about all of the cool stuff I enjoy in the universe, and you get to ask me anything you want about the universe. I don't have a specific topic today, which means it's going to be a lot of rambling and a lot of let's see where you want to go. So I know I've got a bunch of new followers this week from some promotion on Twitter. So hello and welcome. If you're anywhere in Finland, it's great to have you here as well. Hey, James, great to see you in the comments. So yeah, the idea here is that you can ask me anything you want about science, about space, about cosmology, about what it's like being at the university. Um, I will try my best to answer any and all questions you have. Now, of course, I don't have all the answers, but I will try to answer at least the ones I can. As David Dunn is saying here in the comments, please do like this video, leave a comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done so. If you want push notifications to make sure you never miss one of the live things, click the, the notification bell, and then you should get all of the right announcements from YouTube. And in general, I might be using YouTube community posts at some point soon. So if you subscribe to all notifications, you'll get those as well. Still, gonna, still figuring out if I'm going to use YouTube community notifications or community posts, but it seems like something I might be inclined to do. And I see we already have a question from Ben, which is exactly the question that I expected somebody to ask today. Maybe not along those lines, but that is definitely something that I highly anticipated somebody would ask today. So we have the question here of what is ER equals EPR? And the short answer is, I don't know. I have never worked on those concepts, but I know the general context in which this is used. And the general context is wormholes, holography, quantum gravity, and fun stuff like that. So um there's a topic that is definitely worth discussing now there has been people who come on cup of cosmology regularly know that sometimes i i um <laughs> sometimes i will complain about how science is portrayed in the media and how popular science articles sometimes go more for clickbaity titles rather than actual science and it happens frequently where there's a scientist as a and um, the media print A to Z, and suddenly you have a fantastical story that actually never happened. And um, this is something that has happened again, but this time the fault also lies with the scientists in question. So, some of you might have seen over the last week a very eye catchy headline, very sci fi, along the lines of scientists create a wormhole using a quantum computer and send something through. Variations on this have been reported in a lot of different pop sci newspapers, magazines, web pages, variations upon scientists create wormhole, scientists send something through a wormhole, scientists use a quantum computer to, to look at holographic wormholes, variations upon this title. And then if you take to social media or anywhere, you will see a lot of people, a lot of scientists complaining about these headlines. They are misleading. Honestly, they are downright wrong. It's not just misleading this time. They are wrong. Like, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. They are not just extrapolating something beyond the realms. They are wrong. We have not created a wormhole. We have not sent information through a wormhole. And I'm just going to start with this. We have not done this. You know, if we had created a wormhole, I can assure you every scientist you know would be jumping up and down talking about this. The fact that scientists are saying, like, no, this is not actually what happened, 
is because no, it actually didn't happen. And uh, just I, I did see the question about the formula in my Twitter header and about ring galaxies. Those are there, but I, I will come back to them later on because I did want to talk about this topic on from wormholes. Hey Tamara, nice to see you. Welcome to the stream. So the question we have to ask ourselves first is what is a wormhole? Why is it relevant? And what do we mean by, you know, has anyone actually created a wormhole? Um, the reason I'm talking about this in connection to the question of EP equals EPR, sorry, ER equals EPR, is because that is some of the formalism used when describing wormholes. So imagine you have space time. Space time, we can we can imagine it to be this big sheet like space time. Everything in the universe is somewhere in space time. It just means it's somewhere in space and time. Um, usually, objects throughout the universe will travel on the shortest path between two objects. If you have light, for an example, or information or gravitational waves, they will travel on the shortest path between two objects. In space time, when you have curvature, like you have a massive object that is curving space time, this will, this, di this will deflect the path. Like for an example, you take light, a photon, particle of light, will travel at the shortest distance between two objects. Once you have curvature, this might no longer be a straight line. So then we have a problem that we are limited by the fact that nothing can travel faster than light in a vacuum. So when things are several, several thousands or billions of light years away from each other, how can you send information back and forth? Um, if you believe any science fiction, the way you do that is by creating a wormhole. So you have these two points that are really, really far apart. And the way you connect them is by creating a bridge. Now, I'm going to use an analogy here, and I'm going to improvise with my props, mainly for the sake of bringing back a famous prop on the show. So let's just imagine that I am space-time. My entire body is space-time, right? So anything in moving throughout the universe is moving somewhere here. So imagine two points. Each of my hand is a point. Now, if you're moving through space-time, the way you connect, you go from point A to point B, would be to go around, up the arms, down, down, up the other one, right? There is no path connecting my hands that doesn't run through my body. However, what if you could make a pathway appear between my two hands? What if you could create a bridge? And this is exactly what we can do here. We create a bridge. So now if you want to get from my left hand to my right hand, instead of going all the way around, you can just cut across cleanly. And this is the idea of a wormhole. It's a shortcut in space time. And the cool thing about wormholes is they are actually a prediction of Einstein's general, or not a prediction, sorry, they are something that mathematically you can pull out of Einstein's general relativity. It's not a prediction, but it's something that can be described within the general relativity framework. Now, the problem with wormholes, they're very cool in sci-fi. Pretty much every sci-fi series at some point, if it's set in space at some point, they'll use the wormholes. You know, the, the whole premise of Stargate is you create wormholes between two stargates. The whole premise of Farscape is John Crichton is launched through a wormhole to outer space. So there are always, there are very frequently wormholes. It's a shortcut and it's very cool, but it's something that we don't know if they exist. We don't know if they're actually just a mathematical thing that appears in the equations with no resemblance to reality. Um, one of the biggest problems we have with wormholes is that if you were able to create a wormhole, to the best of our knowledge, the moment you try to send anything through this wormhole, it would be too unstable and it would collapse. So the idea of using wormholes to travel between A and B is really cool, but something that physically we're still trying to figure out if that's actually feasible, if it exists, if it's something we can even describe in any meaningful way. <clears throat> so the idea of using wormholes to travel is still a big question as to whether that's something that can actually be done in any meaningful way. Would a wormhole take time distance to travel through as in interstellar, or would it have zero distance and just instantaneous let you in on the other side, let you in and out on the other side? So that very much depends on how the wormhole works. And again, this is something that is not completely set in stone because we don't completely know if wormholes are actually a thing or not. So in the case here where I had this wormhole, it provides a shortcut. Now, there is still some travel time between them because they're not instantaneous. However, you could also try to describe them. If you're saying that this wormhole basically exists outside of space time, then it exists outside of time as well, right? Unless what you're saying is you actually bend space time enough that you kind of bend it back upon itself. But often it's seen that the wormhole exists outside of space time or in the 
boundaries between space time, which again doesn't really make a lot of sense. So travel through a wormhole is very much hypothetical. The duration of travel between a wormhole is, again, depending on what mathematical construct you use to describe a wormhole. And I realized why I hid this from myself for years, because I get easily distracted when Slinky Toy is out. But anyway, Slinky Toy had not appeared in years. It needed to make a reappearance after I refound it today. So yes, wormhole, you create a tunnel between two points in space time, which would allow great, distance, great distances to be traveled in a very, very small time, essentially simultaneously. So you send something one end and it appears at the other end, even if this is light years apart. Does this require a fifth dimension or higher? Again, it depends on how you're describing it. So a wormhole cannot be described in a standard four dimensional space time. So once you want to connect these two points, you need something to describe this wormhole. You can use higher dimensions. You can use something else. You can use this idea that it exists beyond the standard dimensions, beyond space time. It's a, it gets very complicated, but it's something that is very easy to play about with in sci-fi because it gives you a lot of possibilities. So that's wormholes. This idea that you can connect two points of space time very, very easily. And now I want to pause wormholes, move that aside, and move the conversation somewhere else. And we're going to come back to wormholes in a minute. So just keep this idea of a wormhole somewhere in your brain. And we're going to come back to it in a minute. And now I want to talk about something else in quantum, moving completely away from general relativity. I want to move down to the quantum world and talk about quantum entanglement. Now, I did a whole stream on quantum entanglement with one of the PhD students in, in my building. Uh, it's on the YouTube channel. You can look for the quantum entanglement stream. And we spend a whole hour talking about the topic. But the main idea behind quantum entanglement is you can prepare two particles that have similar properties. For an example, if you take two electrons, let's say electrons, these are subatomic particles, and you can give them a spin. So you can say one spins up, one spins down. You can prepare these two electrons so that one is up, one is down. You can entangle them so that one has to be up, one has to be down. But you don't know which is which. Now, until you prepare these two electrons, you send them through a system where one is going to go up, one is going to go down. But you don't know which is which. So these are entangled. And then you send these electrons to different parts of wherever you want, in opposite directions. Now, because these are entangled, one is up, one is down. But because it's quantum physics, there is an uncertainty. You don't know which is up, which is down. And until you measure... They're both in a superposition of being up and down. But the moment you, the instant you measure one of the electrons, it is now determined that it is going to be up or down, whichever. Let's say this one, you measure this one, this one it is up. The other electron that was entangled is immediately going to be down. So you prepare them where you have no knowledge. One is up, one is down. You don't know which is which. You separate them. Because they're quantum, they're, they're tiny particles, they're governed by quantum physics. Until you make a measurement, both electron is in a superposition of up and down. It's in both states at the same time. The moment you make a measurement, one of them is going to collapse into being either up or down. Then when this happens, the other one is also collapsed into being the opposite. Um, this is something that is often referred to as spooky action at a distance, because you are measuring one thing over here, and you are immediately affecting the state of the other one over there. And it's not just that you're gaining the knowledge, because from a quantum physics perspective, until you make that measurement, it could have gone either way, and both particles existed in both states, in a, what we call a superposition of both states. And it's only the moment you make the measurement that this information appears in both places. The moment you make the measurement, you collapse the wave function, and one is up, one is down. And this is something that is very difficult to, to think about because how are we, how is the information going from one place to the other? You know, how, how does that electron know that it needs to be up just because we've measured that one as being down? And of course, we can't just send the information because that would be information traveling faster than light. And we know that nothing can travel faster than light in a vacuum. So then how is the information getting from one place to another? Now, the answer from quantum physics perspective is, well, the information exists in both places, but it's not determined, and the measurement determines it, and it's spooky action at a distance. We do not violate any, we do not violate anything about 
sending thing, information faster than the speed of light, but the information is transmitted simultaneously. And this is something that is very difficult to, to wrap your head around. Right. Um, the first time you meet quantum entanglement or anything about quantum physics in the undergrad, it's like, whoa, what? What? No, the math make, doesn't make sense. It's complicated. It's confusing. And it's super fun and really, really interesting to learn about. Uh, is this related to double slit experiments? So partly double slit experiments is one of the most famous experiments in quantum physics. The idea is you send electrons through a double, you send a beam of particles through an, a grid that has two slits on it. And depending on when or where you make the measurement, the particles will either travel as particles or as a wave. So the electrons will either travel as a wave of electrons and then it interferes with itself or it will travel as a particle. If you put a measuring device right after the double slit, then your electrons will either come out one or another. And if you put a screen afterwards seeing where they hit, you will get one line at the top, one line at the bottom corresponding to each double slit. If you don't make that measurement and you just let them go without making any measurement, they will travel as a wave. The wave will interfere with itself and you'll get multiple slits, sorry, multiple lines at the ends corresponding to an interference pattern of waves. So this is what shows us that doing the measurement affects the behavior of the system. Because in quantum physics, the moment you make the measurement, you are actually interacting with the system. You are affecting the system. So it's not completely related, but it's not unrelated either, because the double slit experiment is something that shows us this idea that doing the measurement affects the system. So when we have our entangled particles, they're in the superposition of both. And it's the moment we make the measurement that the waveform collapses, that the system collapses into one of the two possible configurations. So... This is where we get into the realm of hypothetical. Now, quantum physics is something that works very well at explaining the baby, the tiny, tiny particles in the universe and how everything moves on quantum levels, really, really tiny levels. General relativity is really good at explaining how things move throughout the universe. You know, general relativity gives us gravity. It tells us why we're in orbit around the sun. It tells us how galaxies stick together. It tells us about what happens when an object is traveling at the speed of light. Now, the problem comes when you try to put these two together. In order to do this, you need something known as quantum gravity. We do not have a theory of quantum gravity. We just don't. However, there are there is the line of thought. It is a, a line of thought within the field that this simultaneous measurement, that when you measure one entangled system and it's collapsed and the other one is collapsed, some people interpret this as a wormhole between the particles. So the moment you collapse one, a wormhole is, transmits the information to the other. Hypothetical, there is nothing to tell us that this is true. It is just one way of trying to tie it together. Now, if this is true, it's a first step towards uniting gravity and the quantum world because you can bring together Einstein's general relativity in the form of the wormhole equations and you can bring together the quantum world. It's a very interesting avenue, very complicated, very hypothetical, lots of ifs, lots of maybes along the way here. But it is a step that some people do. Now, is it truly up and down or are those placeholder terms to reflect two different states? That is an excellent question, Samara. And um, it's placeholders. So we always use spin as something that we, we talk about in quantum physics, and it's a property that particles have. But it's very difficult to actually envision spin in any meaningful way. So the, the funny example that people always give is imagine a ball that is spinning, except it's not a ball and it doesn't spin. And that's how you kind of picture spin. But spin is a property that we know that particles have and it is related to their magnetic moment so we call it kind of okay there's some type of moment we can relate it to a spin but it's not physically spinning and when we say up and down that's because okay if it's spinning you can take an axis and say in which direction is it spinning and then you can say it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise going up or down Mathematically, what you actually say is you get plus h bar over 2 or minus h bar over 2, which tells you which direction something will be deflected in in a specific experiment. But we use up and down as placeholder. So it wouldn't physically be spinning up or physically be spinning down. It's kind of a proxy that we use 
to explain this quantum property? So yes, that is a great question, Tamara. Okay, so how do we go about putting together wormholes and quantum gravity and all of this? When it could be either direction and then collapses to be one way or the other, is the momentum now different? Is that illegal? The momentum is not different. Again, spin and momentum, when we say spin, it doesn't really mean a system is physically spinning. It's a property that the system has. But the idea is until you make a, a measurement, the entire system has a specific amount of spin. You know, each particle is in a superposition of up and down and up and down. Each particle has both of these properties until you make the measurement with relative probabilities. So in this case, this particle over here has a 50% chance of being up and a 50% chance of being down. This one over here has the same. The whole spin of the system is equal parts up and down here and equal parts up and down here. Now, once it collapses, you get up in one place and down in another. So then you get 100% up and 100% down. So the total spin of the system, and again, spin is not really angular momentum in any feasible way here. It's just a proxy that we use for quantum property. But the total spin is conserved. It's, it's not breaking any conservation laws. It's just that here you have kind of up and down mix. Here you have up and down mix. And then once you make the measurement, you do no longer have the mixture. It, the spin is properly distributed. Um, if this sounds weird and funky, don't worry. It's supposed to sound weird and funky. It is quantum physics. Uh, it does take a while to wrap your head around this. Not sure how we can measure on the quantum level and not adversely affect the experiment, like shining a flashlight on a cockroach. Yeah, I mean, you, if you think about it, because you're on the quantum level, the act of measuring involves some type of interaction with the system. So it makes sense, right, that when you take a measurement on the quantum level, you are going to be affecting the behavior of the system. This is also why, if you think about it, you can, there's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is that you can't measure the position and the momentum of a particle to infinite accuracy. Because if you get a very good measurement of the momentum, you're going to get a very bad measurement of the position. Because you can either ask a particle, where are you, or how fast are you moving? You can't ask it both. Because as soon as you try to ask it one thing, you affect the other. So the more precisely you answer one question, the less precisely you're going to answer the other question. If I've got that second electron, can I tell if it's in a superposition without observing until collapsing the superposition? If you make no, no observations on it, you don't know what it's doing. But once you've measured one, that one over there for sure is going to be in that specific state. Now, the idea here is that often, you, if you take a random electron that's had nothing happen to it, or it's just doing its own thing, it can be either up or down. The spin is 50-50 chance. You don't know what it's doing. You send it through a magnetic field in a specific direction, and then you know, okay, the, the spin is going to be at least aligned to this specific direction. But the measurement of whether it's up or down, you only know when you do the measurement. Now, if you take either of these electrons at any given time, you have a 50-50 chance for each. But as soon as you've measured one, for the other one, you know longer have 50 50 you now have a hundred percent sure it has been prepared in a specific way so yeah you can't tell if something's in a superposition unless you do the measurement and once you do the measurement you are collapsing it there is there are ways you can verify this by preparing a series of particles and then separating them and then seeing that every single one in one direction is behaving in a way that statistically it shouldn't but only makes sense because it was entangled and you've done the other measurements you thought Heisenberg's uncertainty principle had something to do with not knowing how pure the meth was. Yes, I think that's a different Heisenberg you're thinking of. Uh, so if I look at the particle and someone else doesn't look at it, does that mean it's still in a superposition for them, but not in a superposition for me? I assume you mean the same particle here. So if you're both looking at the same particle, as soon as the measurement is made, it, it's no longer in a superposition. It doesn't matter if I make it or if you make it. If you measure that and tell me this, I've just measured it to be spin up, then I can come along and measure it 100 times. It's going to be spin up. It will maintain that spin up until something else is done to it. So if I measure it now and say this is spin up, it is spin up. 
Now, if you mean the two quantum ones where you have one up and one down, as soon as you've measured this one and it's up, this one is going to be down. It doesn't matter if anyone's measuring it or not. It is going to be down. A hundred different people can measure it. It will still be down. But until the first measurement is made, it can be either. So the quantum computer they use in the experiment simulated entanglement or wormhole work. I'm coming back to that, Ben. I, I definitely am coming back to that. I just wanted to clarify these things about entanglement. And anytime we talk about entanglement, we are going to go off topic. But I am coming back to this whole idea of the wormholes and quantum entanglement. I'm coming back to the misleading headline. I'm getting there. But thank you for keeping me on track there. OK, so what do you do when you want to put the quantum world and general relativity together? Well, here we use something known as holography. And again, I've done a whole stream about holography with a guest from the University of Helsinki, where we did a whole one hour talk about holography and what it means and how it helps us. So holography or holographic duality, as we like to call it, has nothing to do with actually creating a hologram, except it's a useful analogy we can use. Now, when you create a hologram, what you're doing, like the, the sci-fi ones, of, oh, here's a hologram. You're basically creating a 3D representation of a 2D image. So you're, oh, sorry, you're creating a 2D representation of a 3D image. So you're, you're kind of knocking it down a dimension. So holography, in the sense that we use it here, is lowering the dimensions of a problem. So you have this complicated problem to solve, which is relating gravity with entanglement, or with, sorry, with quantum physics. You knock everything down dimensions and you find simpler problems that follow the same laws but are simpler to explain. And then you try to relate these simple ones. And um, this is what we call holography, is knocking it down dimensions or making it a simpler problem to solve and then finding connections. And then at some point seeing if you can scale it back up. OK, holography done in a nutshell because we already did it in a video, quantum entanglement, wormholes. So this new experiment that people have been working on, what they did is they used a quantum computer. Now, a quantum computer is one that instead of sending bits of information or bytes, just uses particles in specific prepared states. So you can entangle particles. These are what we call qubits. And then you send this specific information. And this is me very badly explaining quantum computers, because quantum computers is something that's always like, yeah, that's really cool until I have to explain it. So if a particle arrives on Earth and it's already collapsed, has that proven an alien must have observed it? My, my counter question there, David, would be how do you know that it's already collapsed until you observe it? And once you observe it, how do you know it wasn't collapsed by you? So, um, yeah, it also doesn't necessarily mean an alien observed it. It could mean, for an example, that the particle passed through a very specific magnetic field that caused it to be in, in one direction. But yeah, we can use that to figure out if someone has or hasn't made a measurement. Well, no, we, we, let's go with no. Um, there is an interesting way where you can see if anyone's tampered with an electron in between measurements, which is fun. Uh, and we would really get into quantum information there, which I don't want to get into because I did not prepare to go down the quantum information rabbit hole. So. What this experiment did, what the scientists did, is they prepared a system of seven qubits. And <coughs> so uh, I will get back to the, the question here about colliders in one sec. OK, how do I, let me go to that question in a sec. How do all these quantum physicists doing original experiments? Are they dependent on colliders? Are com computers all that's needed? So if you want to use a quantum computer, it's there are some in existence that can do very simple, sorry, not very simple, that you can use like the Google quantum computer. And for that, you don't need a big experiment. Now, I'm not completely sure I understand your question here. It depends what you want to study. You might be doing a collider stuff. You might be simulating stuff on computers. So it very much depends what you're doing. I'm not really sure I get your question there, James. So if you want to ask that again, I'll try to answer it a second time, perhaps clearly, more clearly. So I will try to answer more clearly. So what these people did is they prepared seven qubits, so seven of these things that you can entangle, and they entangled them with another group of seven. So you have seven here, seven here, and they're entangled. They separated them some distance, as you do when you're doing entangled experiments. And then they modified one of the qubits here, 
and this immediately modified one of the qubits here. Uh, so yeah, seven qubits, it's spelled Q-U-B-I-T-S, qubits. So yeah, seven qubits. Prepared seven here, I know I only have five fingers, but imagine seven here, seven here. They then added a modification to one, and this manifested in the other one where they had entangled it. What does this mean? This means that the entangled system behaved exactly as we expect a quantum entangled system to behave in the fact that there was spooky action at a distance. But this, instead of being done in a normal experiment, was done on a quantum computer. So what does this mean? It means people, in a way, simulated how quantum entangled particles behave. And in doing so, if you believe that this is transmitted via a wormhole, then they also simulated a wormhole. So what they did is they did an experiment with quantum entangled, with, uh, quant they use a quantum computer to kind of illustrate what would happen if you entangled particles here and here and transmitted information along them, which is something that can be explained by stuff that we already know. Now, of course, if you believe that these entangled particles are communicating via a wormhole, which you can explain, you can describe using holographic principles, then you can say, okay, we simulated a wormhole. And they simu simulated, again, they simulated how information travels from one entangled state to another. So from here, going to, we have simulated something traveling through a wormhole. Okay, that's one step. But from there going to, we have created a wormhole and sent information through it. By that, by that analogy, if we, we're doing that, I can draw a wormhole on my paper and say, I created a wormhole. So right, if, if I just do the typical picture here and draw a wormhole on my paper, that there, nice pretty wormhole, I don't think anyone is going to say, I have created a wormhole. And this is as much creating a wormhole as what these scientists did in their experiment. Describing it as scientists simulated a wormhole is already one big step. Saying scientists simulated quantum entangled behavior and explained it exactly as we expect it behaved exactly as we predicted it would behave doesn't sound as catchy. So the problem here is that the scientists involved in this experiment when speaking to the media actually said, we have done this wormhole. So it, it then starts a game of Chinese whispers, right? Where the scientists just throw around the word wormhole on um, we sent information through a wormhole, then the first media reports it as that, and then three journalists later, and it suddenly scientists have created a wormhole and sent information through using holography and quantum computers. Yeah. So this headline came out a few days ago. Um, honestly, I was slightly disappointed by one media in particular, which is Quantum Magazine, and I'm singling them out, and I apologize for that. But Quantum Magazine, I always rely on to give me accurate information. And it's a place that I often go to when preparing my streams. And um, seeing them put out the headline of scientists have created a wormhole and send matter through with breaking news was a bit frustrating. But given the immediate backlash from a lot of scientists, they have since corrected their headline and put out a tweet explaining that they've corrected their headline and they've removed the first clickbaity one. So I have to give them credit for that. So yeah, it's been in a lot of popular science articles. And the question that triggered this was the question of what is EP equals EPR? Um, this is about different definition, ER equals EPR. And this is about different ways you can explain wormhole. So ER is an Einstein Rosen something, which and the EPR is another version of the same thing. So it's basically two different definitions of wormholes, one that you use in the quantum world and one that you use in GR. And then it's a question of, are these the same concepts? Can we actually talk about these in the same terms? So the initial question was EP, sorry, ER equals EPR. Um, that was the 30 minute answer to that question, but I imagine it was connected to this. So short version. If you've seen articles recently claiming that scientists have created wormholes, no, we have not. If you've seen articles saying we have sent stuff through a wormhole, no, we have not. There has been an experiment on quantum entanglement particles on a quantum computer that is very cool by itself. 
but unfortunately does not take us anywhere closer to sending spaceships through wormholes, which is what we would all like to see someday. Oh, Einstein Rosenbridge, thank you. Yes, I always get as far as Einstein Rose uh, something bridge. Yes, Einstein Rosenbridge, thank you, Scott. Yes. So that was a very long answer. I hope that answered the question. And I know this opens up a lot of different things. We can talk about holography, quantum entanglement, and, and we went down the quantum entanglement path, wormholes. It's, there's a lot of cool topics here. And I think they're cool enough by themselves that they don't need to be overhyped and oversold. You know, science is already amazing. We don't need clickbait science because science by itself is already pretty cool. You know, I you can think of places in the universe where there are surfaces of stars that are cold. You can think of places in the universe where you can't see anything. You can think of a place in the universe where all light beams around you would travel in the same direction at the speed of light and you would just see everything. These are places you can imagine. These are places that exist. These are places we can describe scientifically. We do not need to come up with crazy clickbaity articles on, on headlines because science by itself is already so cool and so amazing so i don't know why we need to um come up with more stuff like this but anyway uh that was a very long answer to one question but it's one that i very much expected to come up today so that's why i did actually read up on it a bit but not going down the whole thing of how quantum computers work and quantum information because i would definitely need more preparation for that and i will try to remember to link in this video to both the quantum entanglement one and the holography one so that then you can find those very easier I, I know there's a way i can make them pop up on screen i haven't yet figured out how to do that okay let me just go down to um more answers. We will never find our socks, pens, and keys until we find these wormholes. Yeah, the pesky wormholes. I'm sure anytime you lose something, you can just say, oh, you know, it fell down a wormhole. It's somewhere else in the universe by now. I mean, physically, it's not exactly true, but you can still use that as a semi sort of excuse if you want to. Uh, we will forever think there was a famous scientist called Rosenbridge who wrote papers with Einstein. Yes, Rosenbridge, yes. The Einstein Rosen. Bridge, separate words. And then there was a nice question very, very early on in the stream that came at the same time as EPR and EPR. And I went down that wormhole and that rabbit hole very easily, um, partly because it gave me an excuse to bring out Mr. Slinky, that has been used for props for a lot of things. And today it became a wormhole, a, a very bad wormhole because it moves. And, you know, I can, yeah. Anyway, there was the question very early on about the equation in my Twitter banner, which is also the banner on the Cup of Cosmology YouTube channel. I love my banner image, and I'm very amused at it because one of the rules of Cup of Cosmology is that I never show you equations. I've broken that rule occasionally, but overall, we don't do equations on the show because I try to explain things without maths. However, if you go to the Cup of Cosmology YouTube page, the first thing you're going to get hit with is my banner image, which has an equation in it. Sorry about that, but it is an amazing equation and I love the banner. So the, the YouTube banner and the corresponding equation is this one here. Uh, as always, I have to give credits to the amazing Sunia Heber for creating this banner for me. We were throwing around ideas and, and I pitched something. He was like, yeah, that's good, but I have a better idea and came back to me with this concept, reiterated back and forth. And this is what we ended up with. So this is my banner image. There's a lot hidden here. So there is obviously the big equation in the background. There is the one of the images from the JWST, the Carina Nebula. Uh, there's me sat on the equal sign. There's a reason I'm sat on the equal sign. Uh, there's a planet there in Newton's cradle, all eight planets in the solar system. We have the gravitational waves at the bottom. We have a cat. It is a specific cat, not a random cat. There's a ball of string, which is actually kind of a reference to a family in joke that we have. And of course, there is a cup of cosmology logo floating around there. So there are a bunch of things. And it's me sat on the equality sign with, uh, with the equal sign, sorry, with my headphones on and on my laptop. So this, um, yeah, this is the Cup of Cosmology banner, officially designed by Sunia Heber, who designs all of the cool images, like the logo and the banner here. And it has an equation in it. Equations are great. I should probably learn the differential geometry to get a better idea of what Einstein was on about. Yeah, equations are great, um, really fun, and let you see a lot of stuff. But 
you really have to sit down and, and play about with them and know what you're doing. You know, just seeing a new equation for the first time doesn't really tell you much unless you really understand what's happening. Um, I think if I start bringing out a blackboard and doing a full on lecture with equations, I think not everybody would be interested in that. And I think the concepts behind the equations are fantastic enough that you don't need the equations to, to explain them. So David Dunn is saying, is it Schrodinger's cat? It is not. It is one of the six cats that my mother owns. Uh, my mother has adopted six rescue cats. The uh, cat on the banner here is one of the rescue cats. Uh, those planets are out of order. They are indeed out of order, but then you have Saturn with the big rings at the side. So the planets are indeed out of order. That is correct. Uh, it's a formula for quantum gravity. Not quite. It would be nice if I had that. What you see here is a simplified version of Einstein's general relativity. So in the white box in the top of the screen here, I put the real full version. And then you can see the version that's in the background. So what we have here is G with some indices mu and nu, Greek indices, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we have an 8 pi T mu nu again. Now, if you look at the version in the white box, there's also a C4 and a G. Now, G is a universal, is um, Newton's gravitational constant. It's something that you can measure in nature. It tells you a bit about how strong gravitational force is. The C here is the speed of light. C to the fourth is speed of light <coughs> to the power of four. Now, because these are constants that we know they're not going to affect anything in our overall equations, we can kind of ignore them. So what you often do here is you say, okay, G equals C equals one with physicists. We just, for simplicity, we set G and C equal to one and we ignore them. And then at the end of the day, we'll bring them back in when we need to. So what this is, is Einstein's general relativity in its most simple form. So you have um, on the left-hand side, the G. Now G here is telling you about the curvature of space-time. And the T part on the right hand side is telling you about the energy stress tensor, which basically tells you the energy and matter contained in space time. So what this equation is doing is it's relating the curvature of space time on the left to the matter and energy contained within space time on the right. From here, you get that matter tells space time how to bend and space time tells matter how to move. All of this is here in this equation. What do the mu and nu mean? The mu and nu mean you operate over four dimensions. So let me just get rid of that a sec. I'll bring it back up quickly. So we use these indices, the mu and nu, to mean we go across four dimensions, which means the three space dimensions and the time one. Usually, if you're only working with three spatial dimensions, you use Roman indices. So you use i and j and k and things like that. And usually, if you see an i in physics or a j, it goes between 0 and 3. And if, sorry, it goes between one and three, and the three spatial ones. But if you see the mu nu of the Greek ones, then you have the four to consider. So you consider component zero, which is the time component, and the three spatial components, one, two, and three. So what this is telling us here is that this is actually not just one equation. This is actually 16 equations, because you can set each mu. So you can set the mu's to go between zero and three, and you can set the nu's, the ones that look like v's, to go between zero and three. So then you get combinations, you get like 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and then the same, you get 16 combinations. So they'll take on values of either 1, 2, 3, and 4, or 0, 1, 2, 3, depending on your convention. Often you take you use 0 as the time dimension and 1, 2, 3 as the spatial dimensions. So these are 16 equations. You can then break it down and look at the time components and the spatial components, and you can pull out all of Einstein's general relativity from this. But this is the most simplified form, and it is in my banner because it is one of my favorite equations. It is one that I think is just incredibly simple, incredibly pretty. Um, we actually did a whole stream very recently about the concept of beauty in physics, um, what we mean by beauty in physics. Oh, I did not know I could do that. Oh, whoa, that is cool. I, I just accidentally made my whole stream full screen and lost the whole comment. It's back now. I did not know that's what that button did. So we actually had a conversation recently about beauty in physics. Um, there is this idea that a lot of physicists think that Einstein's general relativity is one of the most elegant theories that we have out there. And mathematically, the fact that you can summarize it in these short 
lines here that fits on my banner image is really, really cool. Not everyone agrees that it is a beautiful model because mainly, you know, it is at the end of the day just an equation and not everyone believes that there is beauty within the equations themselves. But it is and my favorite equation in physics and that is why it is in the banner of Cup of Cosmology together with all of these hidden Easter eggs and details and cool things. I don't know the Einstein tensor or the Ricci curvature tensor. It's defined in terms of metric tensors. I understand well enough, but they're pretty basic. Yeah. Uh, the mathematics behind it is not easy. You need differential geometry. You need um, tensors. You need the curvature. You need all of these things. And this is why it's something that takes quite a while to become very familiar with. But at least for now, here on the Cup of Cosmology, you don't need to worry about what a tensor is it's just relating these concepts together but yes the math behind it really expands into a lot of concepts now i am amused at the the jokes there that the cat isn't sliding off because mu is high enough so often when we talk use friction in physics you call it mu so if the mu is high enough you have too much friction and then the cat can't fall off i am amused at that joke i'm also amused at the people saying cats like to mu yes uh, all of cat puns are deeply appreciated all oh, puns in general i love puns it's the easiest way to derail me from any meeting or anything is to tell a pun and i will start laughing uh, i'm an easy i am easily amused at puns of people in general so yes i appreciate all of the jokes okay going through the comments i know i i have a few to catch up with question from <coughs> question from david howden he asks why are there three space dimensions but only one time one um that is an excellent question. Let me just check that I didn't miss anything beforehand. No, okay. So that is an excellent question. Now we have three space dimensions because that's as far as we've been able to, to measure. So far, you know, I can move in and out, left and right, up and down. These are the three axes along which I can move. You can describe any motion or any, you can position anything with those three. But those three are not enough to completely describe how a system is. And the example I like to give here is imagine two trains on the same track heading in opposite directions. Okay, I'm giving you all of the locations. The, tra the tracks are the same, the trains are here and they're heading towards each other. Are they going to crash? And you can answer that unless I give you the time dimension because if one is traveling today and the other is traveling in 10 years, then they're not going to crash. So to fully understand the system, you need time. And as far as we know, we've only been able to measure one type of time, it goes forward. That's it. That's what time does. It doesn't go up and down, left and right. Time just moves. The inescapable pace of time moving us ever forward, if you want to get metaphysical and dark. So we need three spatial dimensions because we live in a three-dimensional spatial world to the best of our knowledge. And we need one time dimension because that's what we've been able to see so far, that we have these four. So what three space ones, one time one. Your kitten has the highest mirror of my three cats. Yeah, kittens can be very loud. Although there are also cats that are very loud. Incidentally, the cat that is on the banner is a very loud cat. Definitely has a loud noise. Time is one dimension. Yes, three spatial, one time one. There's actually one of one or more theories postulating multiple time dimensions. There are indeed multiple. <laughs> I just saw the other comment of Adriano is easily amused. Uh -huh. Love it. Love the puns. I am indeed easily amused. It is very easy to make me laugh, which is fun when I'm in meetings and somebody makes a joke and I completely derail the whole meeting by just laughing, which happens far too frequently lately. People keep making me laugh in meetings. I blame the people who make me laugh and not me for just being easily amused. But yes, there are some ideas out there that you can have more than one time dimension. But currently, to the best of our knowledge, we have one. Time dimension, three so spatial dimensions. Time keeps keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Inescapable. <laughs> yes. I I am happy to see that everyone is as amused as I am at my offhand comments. Like I made a comment last week about something being a meaningless milestone that I find pleasing. And I know people were amused at that as well. Okay. There was a question very early on, which I will get back to in one sec by Scott, but first question by James. I think time actually differs. One person's hour is faster, slower than another. Yes. Um, especially if you're in a very boring meeting, that hour will feel very, very, very long. 
if you're having fun, that hour will feel very short. Your hour long lunch break is definitely shorter than your nine o'clock meeting. But Einstein's general relativity tells us that time is relative. Time depends on how quickly you are moving. If you travel fast enough, time changes. So what one minute means to me is not the same as what one minute means to somebody on the International Space Station. The further you are away from the gravitational pull of an object, the more distorted time gets as well. So that, that's also fun. And the third question that came in very quickly, so we had three questions right at the beginning, which were the the one about that led to the whole conversation about wormholes and entanglement, had the question about the equation in my banner, which we've covered, and we had the question by Scott about the formation of ring galaxies and how ring galaxies are formed. Uh, and I don't remember the exact wording, but that one is easy to answer because I don't know much about galaxy formation. And the cool thing is, we think we would know by now, but there's still a lot of mysteries in terms of galaxy formation. So it's not completely clear if supermassive black holes form first and galaxies form around them or vice versa, you know, if the galaxy comes first or the supermassive black hole comes first, it's not completely clear. But not every galaxy has supermassive black holes. Some, most do, but occasionally we find ones that don't. Then there are ring galaxies where instead of being spirals like the Milky Way, it's just like a ring spiraling around the centre. And that's fun, and that's funky, and that's weird. And there's there's also galaxies that have bars and then spirals, where we have actual bars and then spirals in the Milky Way. There's ones that just have bars. And galaxy formation is a really fun topic and one that I don't know much about. So I'm not sure exactly what the question was, but my answer is I, I don't know. Uh, the cool thing is I can also say it's still a mystery of the field because there's a lot about galaxy formation that we don't yet know. So um, it's not just me, but although especially me in this case. But yeah, galaxy formation is a fun topic. And someday I would like to find somebody who works on galaxy formation to come on the stream. Uh, that's an open invitation to any galaxy physicists watching this. But I definitely do plan on getting a galaxy evolution stream at some point because that would be really fun and I would learn a lot. Um, fun fact, I almost went into that topic at some point. Uh, I was debating my research focus and galaxy formation and evolution was one that I really wanted to go into. Uh, that's before I fell in love with the CMB and cosmology. But galaxy formation would have been another topic for me. The Einstein tensor is supposed to be uniquely divergence free somehow, though it's difficult to interpret the meaning of divergence with respect to space time. Yeah, so I think um I think we go we get way too technical talking about that. Uh, divergence free is indeed a very mathematical concept. Um, Nadia, if you want to message me about that, I'm happy to discuss that afterwards. You can reach me on Twitter DMs or send me an email, cupofcosmology at gmail.com, or go to the Cup of Cosmology webpage and there's a contact button which just sends an email. But I, I think we could get very easily lost in math detail if we started discussing that now. And I don't have a blackboard to and I'm not going to bring in a blackboard to talk about that. But that is a great point. So if you wanted to want to discuss that more, feel free to message me. Closing time never arrives at the galactic bar. Indeed. Is galaxy formation too small to be considered cosmology? It's an interesting question. Galaxy formation is often considered more astrophysics. So astrophysics deals with specific things inside the universe. Whereas cosmology is more taking the system as a whole. So it's not about things being big or smaller. But there is also an interplay because galaxies can only form with dark matter, uh, to the best of our knowledge. And to explain dark matter, you kind of need cosmology, but then you also need particle physics. So I, I would say that galaxy formation and evolution usually falls more into astrophysics, but there are also cosmologists who work on that. And it you know, very much depends where you draw the boundaries. And it's not clear cut as to what is astrophysics and what is cosmology. Um, often you need these communities to come together, right? This is something, in, a lot of you might have heard me talk about LISA, the, the gravitational wave mission that we're going to launch to space in the uh, next decade. And again, I need to hide the slinky toy from myself because I just found something to fidget with. Now, LISA is an amazing spacecraft that is going to hopefully help us measure primordial gravitational waves, these tiny ripples in the universe. But to do that, we're going to have to clean up all of the astrophysics. Um, I say clean up. Now, as far as the astrophysicists are concerned, my signal in the background is the one that's a disturbance and they want to see the astrophysics. You can see things like binary black holes smashing together. You can see 
big black holes falling into small black sorry small black holes falling into big ones you can see white dwarfs so anytime we want to talk about what's happening with LISA or what's going to happen with LISA, this is a conversation that has to involve astro and cosmo people. So there are the, the line is where one stops and where one starts is very blurred. Um, you know, I have a paper that has astrophysics in the title, and papers have particle physics in the title. So it's it's kind of a bit vague. Yeah, what, one way to tell us apart is cosmology is when I'm online, and um astronomy is when David Dunn is online, astronomy astrophysics. So Depends depends who you ask about different things. But again, that's then moving more into astronomy. So the, the, the division between astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, the lines blur at some point. And then you can make it even more complicated by showing in things like astral particle cosmology, which is technically what my master's degree is in. It's like so all the buzzwords into one. So it's not clear cut, but in general, galaxy formation is it's slightly more on the astral side but it does call heavily on cosmology as well. So I think people working on galaxy formation might call themselves cosmologists, they might call themselves astrophysicists. I will never call, I will rarely call myself an astrophysicist. So yeah, it, it very much, very much depends, but it's not clear cut where the division is there. Um, David Dunn is saying he will be on at 8 p.m. UK time today, special time. So that is then 9 p.m. rest of Europe. I'm not completely sure which platform David Dunn is on these days. I believe it is Twitch. Correct me if I'm wrong now. But yes, join, join David for the astronomy show as well. I, uh, slinky, Slinky Toy. Always a problem. This is why Slinky Toy has been put away in the cupboard for years. But I, I cannot stop fidgeting with a Slinky Toy if I have one on my desk. So it's going back away in the cupboard after today. Yes, Twitch. Okay, so look for David Dunn on Twitch to get more cool astro news in your life because it's also something that you definitely need more of. So somehow, I feel like today we talked about three main questions and it took me nearly an hour, but we did have a lot of questions about quantum entanglement and cool stuff like that. So that's fun. Now, you know, I, I studied quantum physics many, many, many years ago. And it's all somewhere in the back of my brain. And I'm actually relearning a lot of my um, quantum physics now because I'm actually the teaching assistant in Introduction to Quantum Physics, which is fun because I'm looking at things like, wow, I learned this 10 years ago when my brain has forgotten this. And now I'm somehow teaching this, which is terrifying, but also really fun. And it's forcing me to relearn a lot of the stuff about quantum physics and redoing all of the double slit experiments, the Gerlach, all of these things. And it's really fun to actually relearn these concepts. So this is another reason why it's great to chat to people, because when you talk to people, you realize about, about physics, about anything, you realize the gaps in your own knowledge that you then need to fill. So teaching, talking to people, you know, this is where you realize, like, actually, I should go relearn that myself. And you discover cool things. It's always fun. We're always fun. Okay. Um, unless there's been a change of plans, next week I should have a guest on the show. I'm not yet sure what topic we're covering, but next Sunday I should have a guest on the show. I will confirm if there's a guest, or if not, in any case, it will be a notification currently on Twitter until I set up the new home for Cup of Cosmology notifications. Sometimes the best way to learn is by teaching. I completely agree. I feel like teaching is a two-way transfer of knowledge. You teach the students and you learn a lot from the students at the same time. And I think that's what teaching should be. It's, it's a conversation between you and the student. And it shouldn't just be you there, or it shouldn't just be a teacher there dropping, like, this is what I know, and just throwing ideas at you and I expect you to learn. That's not how teaching works. It should be a dialogue, a conversation, a back and forth of here's what I want you to learn and here's how I adapt it based on what you already know. Anyway, I have a lot of thoughts about good and bad teaching and um, I'm actually taking a course now to improve teaching, which is interesting because I'm finding a lot of my pre-existing thoughts are actually backed up by research, which is always cool to know. Definitely some confirmation bias going on there though. And I am once again rambling. I'm a, I am in a superposition of knowing nothing of quantum mechanics and knowing everything of quantum mechanics, yes. Uh, um, every day when I go to the lecture room, to, to or not every day, but the, once a week when I go to the lecture room, I really hope that the waveform collapses into the state where I actually know what I'm talking about. And so far, I've been able to get away with it every week. So for now, for now, that's working. But yes, I, I do, I do learn, before, I do um, relearn a lot of stuff, which is cool. Conversation approach to teaching is what I liked about my undergrad tutorials. Yes, I think you know, some of the best memories I have of lectures 
is when I felt like it wasn't just sat there and listening to stuff, but actually discussing and debating with people and talking to my colleagues about the topic, learning together. So yeah, I, I think um, teaching should absolutely be a two-way thing where you learn as much from the student as, as you're trying to teach. Okay, and now we have reached the one hour mark. So Cup of Cosmology should be back next Sunday, same time as today, that 7 p.m. Central European time, which is 1 p.m. if you're on the East Coast, 10 a.m. if you're on the West Coast. Sunday next week, I should have a guest on to be confirmed. I will send out a tweet with the link for the Sunday stream at some point during the week. Uh, there is a chance that at some point I will either move to YouTube community or I am still toying with the idea of a Discord server. I think there's a lot of potential for fun with um, a Discord server. So stay tuned for that. So thank you everyone for joining. This has been great fun. We've had some really cool conversations, some really cool questions. And it is always fun to just come in and see which direction we're going to take the stream today. So thank you everyone for the questions. Thank you for being here. Always great to see everybody. I hope to see you all again next week. And I hope in the meantime, you all stay safe and take care of each other.